to talk to people about is um, is the understanding of wholesome mind and unwholesome mind. How do you tell the difference? Um, and it is not a matter of the brain. It's all mind, you know. Um, we learn teachings all our lives, you know, using our brain to think, to judge and all that. And uh, we rely a lot on it. And perhaps uh, too much. I mean, we need to rely on our brain to, for the logic and the, and the thinking process. It is an important instrument, as important as the internet and the computer for everyday life. You know? But it is the heart that knows directly. And I want to share this. The understanding of wholesome minds and wholesome mind. How to um, how to be mindful in daily life. You know, we often heard um, meditation masters um, rightly teach that uh, maintain mindfulness in daily life. But in actual practice, how do you maintain mindfulness in daily life? I mean, I have a struggle with this teaching before. You can be mindful as you are, you know, doing something perhaps like. Uh, breaking the precepts, you know, knowing, 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 and then you um, you, you take something, um, pile up your plates in a buffet, you know. So I'm just having this um, I- idea, you know, this question around it. How do you be mindful in daily life? And how do you direct your mind to wholesome, unwholesome? And when we meditate, when it comes to, th- and, and there are hindrances and um, um, obstacles and how do we deal with it and the Buddha says you know, um, right attention, what does it mean um, wrong attention gives rise to sleep and sleep and sleepiness and torpor and gives rise to unwholesome states what do we mean by that so this is one of the important I mean, messages that I really want to talk about and I was given an opportunity by Buddhist fellowship and so I want to talk about this tonight My teacher and her teachers, uh, usually before they give Dhamma talk, they, they uh, pay respect to the Buddha. Oh, and uh, I need to sit a bit higher out of respect to the Dhamma, you know. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato What was the experience as you were listening to the chanting? I'll be covering these uh, few questions. What are beautiful minds? How do beautiful minds arise? Why beautiful minds? And cultivation of the beautiful mind in practice. And what are the learning points? Okay. So what's the experience? What's going on? How does my clothing feel on my body? Let's say at the back, near the waist, um, how does your shirt or your t-shirt feel? Yeah. What's going on in your mind? Think. Okay, perhaps you can think this. Huh? I shall keep the five precepts strictly for the next 24 hours. And it's not just this, you know. As we pay respect to the Buddha, we chanted the three refuges. Buddhang saranang gachami, dhammang saranang gachami, sanghyang saranang gachami. As we chant, we think about this, you know, about taking refuge in the Dhamma, the, the, the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. So what was going on to the mind? So let's investigate what makes up the mind. There is an object. Just now as we are thinking that the object is not a vision of uh, keeping five precepts like you not killing, you know. It's not that. The, the object is a concept of 
having this determination to keep the precepts or the idea of a precept, there's no image in the heart and there's no sound come in. That, that you, perhaps as I read it, there was this sound, but after the sound stops, there was this concept of wanting to keep precepts for the next 24 hours. The object is an invisible one. That is concept as an object huh? when you think, feel. It's a tactile sensation. It's not in words. So when I said that uh, you don't use a brain, I'm talking about a world without words. So like you feel the, 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 the sensation of the clothing on your back, you know, and that is the object, the thing. You know, that, that is the object and the object is there. When you saw the image of uh, a car, and then earlier when you listen to the chanting that paid homage to the Buddha. So there is an object to start with. with. It could be the object of the ear, of the eye, of the nose, of the taste, of the touch, and of the mind. And there is a consciousness. What is consciousness? Um, I shall go through the explanation briefly because I want to emphasize on the beautiful mental factors, so the, the beautiful side of the mind. Consciousness if you were to be aware of it, it's just an awareness, the knowing, 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 knowing. And in this consciousness, there are these seven mind states that happen. These are universal. In all consciousness, in all minds, these seven must be present. Contact. Contact is a phenomenon of the object and the mind touching each other. You know, Not actually touching, but like just now when we talk about um, thinking that I'll keep precepts for the next 24 hours, the object is the concept of keeping the precepts and the mind touching the concept. And of course, there's no hand. We're talking about a world without words. Huh? Contact. And the feeling. How did it feel when, uh, when, you, you, when you were listening to the chanting of Namatasa? You know? Was it a pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, or a neutral feeling? So you have to taste it to know. It's not by the brain, it's by the mind bringing it. Perception. Perception is that labeling, the cognition, the recognizing, the, co- the, the, the cognitive part. Like, Namotasa, this is the, um, the meaning. Okay, after the listening, the sound, you heard the sound, the, the recognition of a sound from a man. Then after that, there is immediately, there is mind processes, the mind observing the what the sound was heard late earlier, then the mind continues with it, perceiving it. Oh, you have, it's paying respect to the Buddha. It's an invisible object, perceiving, perceiving. Volition. Volition is like a the leader of all the pack of all the mental factors, coordinating, gathering everybody to embrace the object. So volition is the part that creates the karma. Like when just now when we were, say, listening to that Namotasa, and after the listening phase, there's the mental phase, and during the time, if you have a lot of respect and humility and faith and uh, wholesome minds, the volition will generate very wholesome karma. Okay? So volition is the dynamic aspect, the will, the willingness, the 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 organizing of everything to embrace that object, and it has got a force, the karmic force. It's the leader of the pack. Concentration, in every mind, there is only one object at each time, and only one object, there is no distraction for that little tiny bit of a moment. So that is the factor of concentration. And then attention. What is attention? Attention is directing the mind on the object. For example, you see the, the daffodil. Immediately there is the eye and the contact. No, okay, at the initial phase of eye contact, you don't call it daffodil because you just see like a, maybe a beautiful flower or a yellow color or, a, or, f- or perhaps a, a, a shape of a flower or an image. The eye will just have that contact and the feeling perhaps a pleasant one, um, and then uh, perceiving that oh, yellow you know, or something, and the volition, and then immediately the, at that point in time, there's concentration, and the mind averting to it is attention. And the mental life. Mental life, the mind 
arise and pass away. It's a mental life that sustains the mind and it feels like life. Okay, even as we are talking about this, in the practice of uh, vipassana on the nama, you have to feel it without the languages. You have to feel, okay, how does concentration feel like to you? How does attention feel like to you? How does mental life feel to you? You have to know. And then you try your best to describe. Uh, okay, um, I'm, I, I, I have still, still a long way to go, so I better go a bit faster. Okay, so these are the universal contact, feeling, perception, volition. So feeling has got three types. Only one type at each time. Neutral, unpleasant or pleasant. Concentration, and then attention and mind's life, the jivita, the mental uh, life faculty. And you have occasional. So these seven mental factors are necessarily present all the time in all minds. But these six, applied thought, sustained thought, joy, decision, desire and energy are not always present in all minds. The first one, I, 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 yeah, I uh, accidentally have covered it. It's called applied thought. It's the mind applying itself onto the object to think it. It's, when we say thinking, I think about, uh, say just now I chanted Namo Tassa, I think about that. There is applied thought on that object. Huh? When we're listening, there is listening, there is also applied thought on the sound. Sustained thought is after you apply the mind, and even at the same mind moment, there is this application and this clinging onto it. It's like hooking onto it. Okay? And then joy. Joy is an elation. It's like, uh, it, the feeling is like, like you're floating. Huh? Like uh, um, jubilation. Huh? So that's uh, joy. Joy and feeling is a little bit different. Joy and happy feeling. Joy is like when you're a uh, traveler on a desert and you see a... a a pool of spring water, there is joy. But when you go to the water and bathe and take your drinks, you have bliss. That is pleasant feeling. So joy and pleasant feeling, the feeling is different. Decision. Decision, Adi Mukha, um, that's the Pali term. If you under, understand the word, huh? Adi is the, it's like a, um, a highest, Mukha is released. It's like a surrender, a sense of surrender. Occasional, they are neither wholesome nor unwholesome. They are neither beautiful or unwholesome. Eh? So you can have surrender into a wrong object, like I shall steal. There is a surrender, the decision to steal. You know, Like uh, when you see something that is uh, uh, beautiful and there is this greed attachment to it, there is a decision to be attached to it, to, you know, Fall in love, for example. You know, there's a decision in that. But there's also decision in, say, like, uh, I shall not move for the next one hour. I shall not have wandering thoughts for the next one and a half hours. I shall keep the five precepts strictly for the next 24 hours. You know, that is also a decision here. It is, it, for each mental factor, you can expand it and understand it as it develops into determination, into vows and and this is very important for the whole practice. Huh? Our whole practice is all about busy vows and promises, and we have to keep the promises to ourselves. And this is the decision mental factor working. And there's desire. Desire is occasional and is neutral. It's neither wholesome nor unwholesome. Desire can be a desire for a wholesome object, desire for an unwholesome object, like a desire to see the Buddha again and again. Like when we see the Buddha, there's this joy. The mind want to continue with the same object or the I want to continue with the same object. That's desire and it's wholesome. Okay? Energy. Energy is a mental factor that keep everything up. It's like a heroic um, feeling of keeping all the mental factors on the object. It's, of course, another very important factor on the practice. Okay? And occasionally we can have unwholesome mind. And in unwholesome mind, these four mental factors are necessarily there, always present in all unwholesome mind, which are ignorance, okay, restlessness, shamelessness, and fearlessness. And what is this ignorance? Ignorance is not knowing, not knowing the truth. It is like being blind. 
example when um, you are uh, you want to say enjoy your ice cream, you're enjoying your ice cream. Uh. I mean, um, there's this attachment. There's actually that not knowing that this is impermanent suffering, also you're enjoying yourself as if you're passionate about it. Uh. I mean, uh, um, let's for the moment we don't discuss about the morality behind attachment, uh, but uh, you can. I just want to um, illustrate the feeling of ignorance. It's about uh, like being blind, uh, like that, engrossed in whatever you do, and it could be unwholesome. The, the yeah, I like the Chinese translation for it, if I may do so. Me, you know, being like you don't know. Restlessness is an agitation. When you're doing unwholesome things, or when the mind is unwholesome, and you're looking at something and you're thinking that it is uh, permanent or it's mine, the mind is agitated. If you're sensitive, you will feel that. Huh? And shamelessness and fearlessness, huh? there's, a, there's a sense of uh, gang-ho, you know, of dare, you know, daring. You know, to do, okay? And there's this factor of shamelessness plus fearlessness. Later, we go on to beautiful mental factors where I'll discuss on shame and moral dread. I'll develop a bit further into these two mental factors. And in an unwholesome mind, you can... I mean, we always know that uh, what is good and what is bad. Bad means there is good hatred and delusion, right? So delusion, ignorance is always present in all unwholesome mind. And then you can have greed and wrong view, and you may not have aversion. When greed is present, there is no aversion. When there's aversion, there is no greed. Okay, in greed, there is you. There can be accompanied by wrong view. Wrong view is different from ignorance. Ignorance is just this not knowing. Wrong view is a conviction of something that is wrong. For example, a conviction or a belief that this is mine, or this is myself, or a strong belief that oh, this is the most beautiful flower I've ever seen. This beauty, the beauty is real, you know. There's beauty in this world. You know. okay, we also suspend our value judgment on what I've just said, but you know, there is this conviction of um, of an ignorant belief. You know. um, it is based in craving. It's based on greed. You want, and so you believe. Some people say, "What you believe in? What you want to believe?" You know, we want to believe in 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 a soul. You know. So we have a wrong view of a soul, that there's this permanent thing that's always going on. Or we want to believe that there's nothing after I die. Dust to dust. Um, yeah. So, and we believe that there's no rebirth, there's no karma and all that. No? So, Greek conditions, wrong view, wrong view conditions, greed as well. Okay, and uh, in greed, uh, you can, just now in the previous slide, you can see joy. In greed, you can have joy. And sometimes in greed, you, can, you may not have joy. When there's no joy, the feeling is equanimity, a neutral feeling. When there's joy, the feeling is a pleasant feeling. So when it feels good, it is not necessarily good. Okay? It feels good, it could be wrong view and greed. Okay? But, uh, yeah, okay. Then greed can also be associated with conceit. It can also have uh, no joy feeling, or it can be associated with joy. Okay? Conceit is like what? It's like uh, thinking that, Wow, I'm still so young. Oh, wow, this uh, clothes uh, fits me very well. You know, all that. Oh, wow, I've uh, done achieved so far. And conceit is not just thinking yourself high. It's also thinking yourself lower than others and thinking yourself being equal to others. Conceit is defined as a consciousness, the blue color this, uh, the awareness. It can be likened to that consciousness gone mad. Okay, the consciousness arise and pass away, and suddenly things that me, you know, and that is conceit. There's no me. The consciousness arise and pass away, you know. Okay, so conceit can have joy and it may not have joy. Okay, and aversion. Okay, aversion is a feeling of harshness or rejection. Like you look at the flower, you you somehow you don't like it perhaps from some past karma or perception or something, you hate it. And in aversion, there can never be joy. And the feeling is always unpleasant. 
So you can see, if your feeling is unpleasant, there has, it has to be aversion on your mind. There has to be hatred. If it's guilt, it has to be unwholesome. If it's depression, it has to be unwholesome. You know? If it's uh, worry, is it pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling? It's unpleasant feeling. It definitely is associated with aversion. Okay, so you can also tell whether there's aversion or not by the feeling. And aversion can exist on its own, but it can also exist with jealousy. Jealousy is seeing other people's success, you're very unhappy, and you hate that. Okay? And uh, stinginess. Uh, stinginess is like um, hiding your successes or what you gain. Because uh, this is just stinginess, but aversion with stinginess together is hiding what you gain, but there is an unhappy feeling and some kind of aversion directed either at the other beings that you want to hide away from, okay? Or the idea of, um, of cannot let other people see. So it's not a visual object, but it's just a concept and there's aversion associated with it on the object of people see taking your things and there is this hiding away and there's stinginess and there is unpleasant feeling definitely. Okay, or kukucha, or this is known as remorse. Remorse is regretting things that you have, uh, good things that you should have done, you didn't do, or bad things that you shouldn't have done, but you did. Uh. So that is the feeling of remorse or guilt. It's the social with aversion, hating that deed, or hating yourself, you know, and it's definitely unwholesome. Or it could exist with... Uh, the two mental factors of sloth and torpor, which is uh, when there's greed, uh, sorry, wrong view or associated with uh, conceit, and uh, but this is in a way prompted. For example, um, for example, you never think very much about your looks, but somebody keeps saying that oh, you look very good, and then you think about it, yeah, I look very good. Okay, then that is greed with conceit plus sloth and torpor. If you examine the mind, the mind is a bit weaker. So if you were to examine it, you know that even if the karma of this greed and, and uh, conceit were to arise, it's a very weak karma. It's a prompted, unwholesome mental state. Um, and it can be associated with joy, you know, or without joy. Okay. And uh, even aversion can also be prompted. Hey, this person uh, is harming you, you know, you should get angry, you know, get back at him. Then this and then because of what this person tells you, and then you start to think, yeah, I've been wronged. Mm. Then there is this aversion. But this aversion is a very weak one. If you were to examine the mind, there is, a f there is this weakness of the mental factors and the weakness of the consciousness in wanting to hate that person. You know? So that is a prompted aversion. That means it's a aversion which is a bit sluggish. The karma is not as strong as one that is completely unprompted. I hate that person, I've been wronged, you know? Or, it can just be associated with uh, doubt. In doubt, what is doubt? Doubt is a, a feeling of taking either, neither stances, you know? Either this or that, that and that, you know, that you cannot take, make a decision. Doubt. Um, and in doubt, the occasional mental factors Definitely there's no joy. When there's doubt, there's no pleasant feeling. Huh? It can be unpleasant feeling or a neutral feeling. And there's definitely no decision. Okay? In decision, there is decisiveness. In doubt, there is no decisiveness. And there's no desire. There's no desire on either options. Okay? So that's doubting mind. It's unwholesome mind. Um, sometimes when we cannot make decision, we can suspend the judgment, but we don't dwell in the doubt. So that is different from this doubting mind. Doubting mind is the mind. We're not talking about the brain again. Huh? It's about the mind. Okay? It's about this, cannot, this indecisiveness in the heart. The karma is unwholesome, especially if the doubt is related to the teachings of the Buddha or the practice of um, um, keeping morality, concentration, and uh, practice of... Uh, meditation, or doubt about the law of karma, 
I mean, some of us don't quite believe it because we haven't seen all these things, and that's fine. You don't dwell in it. You know, you just suspend the judgment. It's not a doubting mind. You know, it's just suspending judgment. I move on. I have other things. I believe in morality, so I practice morality. Law of karma, I believe as much as uh, the moral moral law in this universe go. I believe, but about past life, future life, I'm not sure. But if you always dwell on it, is there past life, future life? And that's doubting mind. Okay. Okay. All. Without doubt, without aversion, without uh, greed, it is uh, there is decision, but there is no desire, there is no joy, and this mind is known as restless mind. Like when we meditate, and suddenly we we have an image of a childhood event, which we never really intended it to happen. We didn't; it just happened, you know. Or that when we meditate, and then we just want to um, direct our attention to our perhaps the back or the knee. You know, there is not even pain, but we just want to check, you know. And that is just agitation. It's a very mild, unwholesome karma rooted in ignorance. And that's uh, if you check that mind, there is no joy, and there is no desire. We didn't want to do that, but it, the mind just go there. Okay? And that is uh, ignorance, restlessness. It's, it's known as a restless mind. Huh? This mind is a restless mind. It's a mild, unwholesome mind rooted in ignorance. Okay, the main topic I want to talk about today is this one, beautiful mind. Beautiful mind, the, all the occasional uh, occasional mental factors are there. Joy may or may not be there. and uh, But in um, um, jhanic concentration, um, uh, second jhana, you don't have applied thought and sustained thought. In the third jhana, you don't have joy. In the uh, fourth jhana, um, still no joy, but... Uh, um, that even the feeling part is no longer a happy feeling. It's just a neutral feeling. Huh? So, um, but otherwise, wholesome minds are this. Okay? This is a complete set. Or uh, not totally complete because uh, there are three, two other groups I haven't brought it in. You can see that... Um, uh, okay, there's no pointer. That there's this wind, wisdom and then there's joy. Okay? And altogether in that uh, um, square with round borders, there are 19 mental factors. All these 19 must be there. So all in all, if you add up, there are 34 mental factors. Okay. Okay, these 19 are faith. What is faith? Okay, I'll explain all this in subsequent few slides. Uh, and shame. Moral dread. Non-hatred. Non-greed. Mindfulness, equanimity, tranquility of mental factors, tranquility of consciousness. It's tranquility, but it's divided into two because in the observing of this tranquility, there is tranquility of mental factors and there's tranquility of this awareness at the base of it. So there is this uh, two mental factors here. Similarly, for the subsequent uh, five pairs, uh, there are altogether six pairs, lightness of mental factors and lightness of the Consciousness, softness of mental factors, softness of consciousness, um, wildiness of mental factors, wildiness of consciousness, proficiency of mental factors, proficiency of consciousness, uprightness of mental factors, uprightness of consciousness. These 19 mental factors always come together. If there is faith in your heart now, there has to be shame, it has to, there has to be moral dread, and there is mindfulness at that point in time. And the mind will be equanimous. There will be tranquility, there will be lightness, there will be softness, wilderness, proficiency, uprightness. All these are there. It's just a matter of different uh, weightage. You know? Sometimes the mind, equanimity is very strong, like the fourth jhana and the third jhana. Equanimity mind is very strong. In first jhana, it's the wholesome mind. Equanimity, equanimity must be there, but it's not, so ob- it's not as obvious as the rest. In the first jhana, it's the applied thought and sustained thought are very prominent. So it's different weightages. But in all wholesome mind, you always have these 19 mental factors. So if you want to talk about being mindful in every everyday life, you're as might as well just say that there is shame and moral dread in daily life. There is non-greed in daily life. There is non-hatred in daily life. There is faith all the time in daily life. You know? So they always come together. Wisdom may or may not be present. 
joy may or may not be present. So you can have this whole set of 34 mental factors. Consciousness is one. The seven, eight, plus this six, which is uh, uh, 14, plus 19 is your um, 33, plus wisdom is 34. Okay. Okay, you can have wisdom and wholesome mind without joy. For example, you can uh, see the Buddha and then there's a lot of space, but for a moment you are contemplating the Buddha's teachings of impermanence. Or perhaps something drastic happened to you or your family Im- immediately after the moment of sadness and, and, and depression or anger. You suddenly remember about mindfulness and you go back to mindfulness and when there's mindfulness the faith is there the shame is there the non-greed non-attachment the equanimity the non-hatred it's all there My, the wholesome mind is the whole set is there and this penetrative wisdom of understanding some insight about life and there is no joy at the moment and this is still wholesome okay? 33 mental factors or it could be joy without wisdom for example we look at the Buddha and there's this happiness around it. You know? we, we like it because there is a faith and the shame, moral dread, uh, non-greed. But if you're like focusing on the beauty, oh, it's a beautiful statue, it's a great piece of art, it's altogether it's different, it's not wholesome anymore. But you look at it, oh, it's a Buddha, the idea of a Buddha come in, but you don't know what Buddha means and you have no any insight into the... Um, uh, into Buddha or Dhamma or Sangha. And at that point in time, there may be joy, but there's no wisdom. Okay. Or you can have no joy, no wisdom. For example, um, perhaps uh, some of you here, I mean, perhaps uh, uh, you may not quite uh, um, uh, say, um, follow what I'm saying, you know, and... Um, but it's uh, still a wholesome mind here. You know, there's still this faith about the Dhamma, and there is this mindfulness being present in the present moment, and this uh, sense of conscience, the shame and moral dread together is this sense of conscience, clear conscience, tranquility of mind, lightness of mind. There's no joy here. You're not really happy or sad about the this Dhamma talk, and there is no. Um, and perhaps you. Um, uh, don't quite understand what I've been saying. You know, then there's no wisdom, there's no joy. But it's still a wholesome mind. It's still a good karma, after all. Huh? When when you go on a retreat and uh, if uh, you're always practicing, um, perhaps no concentration, you cannot still catch your breath. But you're not angry at yourself. You're just putting in your effort every day. Keep the precepts. You know, there may not be joy, there may not be wisdom, but it's wholesome mind still. That's why when you go on a retreat, meditation retreat, sometimes there may not be uh, um, progress uh, um, on the practice, but it's wholesome mind for mo- many, many, many times. And it's a lot of wholesome karma. And then there are three other mental factors or social wholesome mind. It's not always present. These are the occasional wholesome. Wholesome mind, those in the purple square box must be present. But right speech, right action, and right livelihood may not always be present. For example, I'm about to tell a lie, but I stop myself. At that point in time, I have wholesome mind, I have right speech mental factor. Okay? And I'm supposed to, I'm, I'm, I see an ant I want to kill, but then I stop myself there. There is all this, and if, even if there's no joy um, or no wisdom, but there's this stopping, this abstention, and there's a mental factor which is distinct from the rest, and that is right action. Okay, right livelihood is similar. When you can get a chance to take up a position or a work or something, but you suddenly think about right livelihood, the five wrong livelihood, you are not supposed to do that. Maybe, for example, you want to sign up for the uh, application to be, say, in a uh, selling beer or something. You know, Then you want to think, oh, you're not supposed to sell intoxicant. You stop yourself signing it. There is a moment of right livelihood there. Then apart from this, this, of course, the famous uh, compassion and sympathetic joy is different from the rest. The four Brahma Viharas that some of you may be aware of, the practice of uh, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. Loving kindness is a 
an elaboration of the mental factor of non-hatred. So it doesn't stand as one extra mental factor. The equanimity is the um, develop, developed equanimity in that uh, um, purple box. So that is uh, equanimity mind um, developed until the level of illimitable or um, Brahma Vihara. But compassion and sympathetic joy is different. Compassion is you have wholesome mind, you know, and you have loving kindness. But you see this being helpless and suffering. In the mind, there is an extra um, ingredient here now. It's the feeling of wanting to relieve the suffering, or wanting to help. But it's, it's not, again, uh, not brain, not, not, not words, but it's this feeling of wanting to help. And that is compassion. Sympathetic joy is it's like when somebody helps you, you feel very happy, grateful, you know, like wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Or when somebody do something very good, huh? you have this wonderful, you want to say sadhu, 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 or you, you don't use Pali words, perhaps you just think that that's very good. And that is uh, sympathetic joy. Or that somebody help you and that uh, you're, you want to say thank you. When you say thank you, there's sympathetic joy. Perhaps no wisdom. But when you say thank you and you understand that he's doing something wholesome and this is good karma, there's this insight about wholesome mind, unwholesome mind and there's a factor of wisdom there as well. And you have all 35 mental factors with sympathetic joy when there's a great gratitude in your heart. Okay, compassion and sympathetic joy. Oh, I'll be repeating myself again in the subsequent slide so I think I'll just go on faster. Okay, so... Uh, this just to <laughs> illustrate. Uh, it's like Tom Yam soup. It's uh, you know when we study uh, when when you when you want to understand wholesome mind and wholesome mind, it's really about tasting and see. Oh, is there uh, sour? Is there hot? And it's not in words. And then you can see that uh, this is uh, too hot or too sour. You know, so it is like Tom Yam soup, or perhaps it is. Like a herbal soup. <laughs> okay. The water is like consciousness, it's present in all things. Then perhaps the the um yeah. So really the mind moment to moment is it wholesome and wholesome. It's not about you arguing and debating that I'm wholesome I have wholesome mind or that he has unwholesome mind. You don't know. You can't read minds, you know. But for yourself, if you have deep concentration, you are able to see this is that was wholesome mind. That is unwholesome mind. The feeling is different. Wholesome mind is, yeah, unwholesome mind is a bit tight. You know, wholesome mind is really like spacious. But as you go on to define the mental factors, you'll be able to tell. I mean, a bit better. We are trying to use words to point to the feeling. It's like uh, the six the six patra uh, using the finger pointing to the moon. Okay. So let's see what are. Um, the, the definition of the mental factors. What is faith? Faith is um, in 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 the study of all these mental factors. Um, you see, in order to to explain this taste of the soup, you know, how do you explain? So the 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 ancient teachers explain based on this way of classification. What is the characteristic of faith? What is the function? How does it manifest to a meditator? And what's the proximate cause? So faith is yeah, the characteristic of trusting and function to clarify. Like a water clearing jam, which I've never seen before, causes muddy water to become clear. It's like when you have muddy water, but there's this faith, it clears. You know? Like uh, say you, um, your perhaps something bad is happening to you or something that's very good that's happening to you. And the mind is either very sad or, or very happy, you know. Then suddenly you see the Buddha, and then you see that it's all the effects of karma. And there's this faith there, and then it's clearer. Okay. Okay. Or that uh, you listen to a Dhamma talk, and suddenly um, the Dhamma seems to strike a chord in you, and there's this faith there. And there's a clarity for the time being or at that moment. And that is the function of faith. As one might set forth to cross a flood, you know. A mind without faith cannot acquire the wealth of Dhamma, even in the midst of it. 
So if you're always in doubt, always skeptical, always searching, searching, and then everything has been told to you, and then you're supposed to meditate, but the, all the things are not out yet, so you still don't want to take the first step, you know, then, then uh, it's like a, a, someone in a treasure cove, and he doesn't use his hands to take, he has no hands. He's just observing and studying. Observing and studying is um, still not sure that this is real diamond, although it is perhaps 99% real diamond, but not totally 100%, so he doesn't take yet. You know, that is uh, the problem with our faith. Okay. Manifestation. How does it manifest to, uh, to a meditator? It's a, it's a feeling of clarity, you know, like, yeah, I can. Yeah, this is it, you know. That's faith. Proximate cause. Something to place faith in, like um, the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, law of karma, hearing a good Dhamma. Then immediately you have that faith. It can be confused with, um, okay, this is my own understanding. My, my knowledge is not complete. So sometimes, uh, even as we give Dhamma talk, I have to give some examples. And I, please forgive me if it may not be totally correct. You know? Sometimes you can have wrong view and you have this conviction that that is right and you have that confidence. It may not be faith. It's just fearlessness of wrongdoing and shamelessness and the uh, wrong view and decision and the rest of the occasional mental factors, you know. It may not be faith. It may feel like faith. And uh, okay, I understand that there some in the audience are not Buddhists and this is my own understanding. As long as you believe in some kind of moral law in this universe, it is a right faith. That some kind of right will give you right. Good will give you good. Good deeds will give you good deeds. And there is um, heaven to go to. Or there is some woeful place somewhere that if you do wrong deeds, it will go to. As long as this is part of your faith, as far as, as a Buddhist myself, I think that is right faith. Okay. That there's a conviction in some kind of mora- morality which is beyond... Uh, um, uh, rational thinking, no need proof. Okay, that wrong thing sure will give you wrong result. Mindfulness. What is mindfulness? The characteristic is non wobbling, not floating like a god, but sinking like a rock into a wholesome object. The function is the absence of confusion or non forgetfulness. Manifestation is guardianship instead of confronting an object. Proximate cause, strong perception, or the four foundations of mindfulness. Okay, how does it feel like? Sometimes we can, uh, we can. I mean, I use the example that I gave earlier. You can do wrong things like going to steal, but you mindful, 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 steal. I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. You know, mindful. But the feeling is not mindfulness. Mindfulness is this confronting, not floating away, not agitated, just confronting. And as a guardian, it's um, guarding all the uh, the mind on. Um, protecting the mind and confronting the object. When you're doing unwholesome mind, the mind is not relaxed. It won't sink onto the object or the bad deeds that you're trying to do. It is just applied thought, perception, sustained thought, confusing you and you think that they are mindfulness. But the mindfulness factor has a special characteristic. Okay? And the proximate cause is strong perception. Say, for example, you're supposed to be mindful on the breath, which is one of the four foundations of mindfulness. You're trying to practice concentration, so you're doing anapanasati, and you're trying to be mindful, remembering, remembering, remembering. But if you, are, if you perceive the breath clearly, oh, yes, this is breath. If the perception, uh, one of the earlier mental factors I talked about, perception is strong, the mindfulness will be there. Suddenly, you can sink in. You know? Then you go with the breath. You, know? you don't float away. You just sink in like a rock. And all the rest of the 34 mental factors all will be there. You know, there will be joy, there will be penetrative wisdom, understanding all there. Until the mindfulness gain momentum and you just sink in. No distraction, no me, no just the breath only. The breath by then will become a nimitta, a clear nimitta. So you just sink in. That is 
the culmination of mindfulness into jhana. Okay. Shame. Okay, shame and moral dread. It's a very important thing. So, previously when I saw this, I had some doubts, like um, some kind of value judgment about uh, right and wrong. But then, it's also similar with what Confucius taught about conscience, about um, that all of us have conscience, you know, that there is this disgust that uh, wrongdoing, not wanting to do evil, shrinking away from evil, and the proximate cause is respect for oneself, that we're not animals, you know, and moral dread is like we we just cannot do any wrong thing, and shrinking away from evil, and the proximate cause is respect for others. It is like um, an obsession with not doing wrong things. In all wholesome mind, perhaps if you check yourself now and if it's indeed wholesome mind, there is this sense of clear conscience okay? and about uh, this self-dignity about not doing wrong things in this present moment. And also something interesting here. If you have respect for others and respect for your, yourself, there will be shame and moral dread in your heart. And by... Um, the law that I talk about, if you have shame and moral dread, you have the rest of the 32, 33, or 34. So, it is good to be respectful. Carry yourself in daily life with respect. And then your heart is mostly wholesome and you'll be mindful in moment to moment. Okay. Non-greed. It is, um, it is like uh, water on a lotus leaf. It can be there, you know, but the water is not staining or sticking onto the lotus leaf. And it can slip off. There's no repelling that it should go or it should stay. You know, it's, It can be there, the water droplet, and it can just flow off. And the lotus leaf remained unstained and not wet. Okay, that is non-greed. Okay, um, greed, what is greed? Greed, it, the analogy is like uh, you're, you're frying a piece of meat and you overcook it, it's stuck to the plate, you know, stuck to the pan. And that is greed. So greed in the very mild form is just a little bit of attachment. Attachment. If not for attachment, we won't be here. And um, so, attachment is part of um, is is part of our habits. Okay. Between greed and hatred, the Buddha says greed is less blamable, but more difficult to get rid of. And the manifestation for a, a meditator or somebody who is uh, conscious of mind is a feeling of detachment. Like just now, when I talk about one of our relatives pass away, immediately there is depression, there is anger. But after that, there is a sense of wholesome mind coming in and you see there is a, there's a moment of detachment there. It's a basis if you develop further. The mental factors are the basis, but if they are developed further, they can, they can taste even stronger, like in the moment of generosity, of material wealth, of like your, in, your inconvenient you're inconvenienced by somebody who asks you for help, then you let go of your time and you go and help. That's a moment of generosity, of non-greed, uh, of sacrifice, of keeping the bones to yourself and meat to, and the flesh of the chicken or what to to the dog or a cat. You know, of altruism, of uh, wanting to to sacrifice your own. I, 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 was, uh, I received this poem I'd like to share with all of you at this point. T.S. Eliot. The forest is beautiful, dark and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. Like, um, yeah. So it's a moment of, you, you, of non-greed. You know, you, know you you, you want to rest, but no, cannot, not yet, you know. Non-hatred, what is non-hatred? It's a mind's lack of ferocity, not harsh, not wanting to destroy. And um, it's a basis of friendliness, loving kindness. And it can be, this non-hatred is just this friendliness, this agreeableness. But if you develop this with an object of a living being in front of you, there will be, it can develop into loving kindness. So loving kindness and non-hatred is the same. It's just different stages of development. Equanimity. 
um, it's an impartial view of object, um, maintaining a balanced mind, neither excited or disinterested. The analogy is like a charioteer who looks on with equanimity at the thoroughbreds progressing evenly along the roadway. Tranquility. The characteristic is quieting down of disturbances and the function is to crush such disturbances. The manifestation is peacefulness and coolness and the proximate cause is the mental factors and the consciousness. It is like... Um, a traveller under hot sun then go into a shade. You know? Like it's a very hot day, then you come into an aircon room. And without minusing away the greed and attachment to cold temperature, just that tranquility, that is tranquility. Okay. Lightness, subsiding of heaviness. We're talking about mind here, not body. Yeah? The he- lightness of the mental factors, lightness of the mind, of the consciousness. And this lightness is it's like a feeling of alertness, agility. It's opposite to sleepiness, you know, the lightness. Like sometimes when you have very good sleep and you're working and you find that uh, your your heart is very agile, very very light, you can do anything. But sometimes on certain days, I just cannot think, you know, that's when you're not enough sleep. You know. Softness, the subsiding of rigidity. We're talking about mental rigidity. Um, it opposes views and conceit, uh, wrong views and conceit, which are basis of stubbornness. Okay, the mind is very rigid. Cannot, must be like this. No, must be like this. You know, then the softness overcomes this. It's like applying water to the dough. It becomes very malleable. It's not hard. You can actually mold it into curry puff or bake into bread or bake the cake. You know, you add water, it becomes soft. When the mind is soft, not rigid, it can do anything. You want it to stay still, no wandering thoughts. It will stay still for you and no wandering thoughts for you. Okay? And your mind is very soft, you concentrate easily. When you concentrate easily, your mind very soft, you see things as they really are, easily. And when your mind is very soft, you keep the precepts easily. You let go. Things that are not yours, you don't take. You know? Wildiness. The curious word. <laughs> it's just a matter of this efficacy of the mind. Huh, that is very useful. Like At this point in time, you feel powerful, you know. In the moment of wholesome mind, you feel the mind will just be so obedient to you. Okay. Proficiency is like mental health. Okay. The mind in a wholesome mind, the mind is very healthy. It opposes the the lack of faith and it causes which causes unhealthiness to the mind. Uprightness. Very interesting. This is the feeling of integrity that you are true to yourself in a moment of wholesome mind. You are straightforward. You are not crooked. There is no hypocrisy at all. There is um, honesty. You know, at the moment of doing good things like uh, you pay respect to Buddha, if you check, there is this straightness in you. You know, and when you want to help someone, there is this clear conscience, which is shame and moral dread. But there is also this sense of uh, being true to yourself. Right speech, right action and right livelihood, I lump them together. It's a mental restraint against lying, against killing, stealing, sexual misconduct and unwholesome means of livelihood. The characteristic is non-transgression by speech, body or, or, or your livelihood. To shrink back from evil deeds, abstinence from such evil deeds. And the proximate cause to keeping these three, um, these three mental factors our faith, your conscience, and the fewness of wishes, simplicity, you know, of contentment. Then you keep the right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Compassion. The characteristic is promoting the removal of suffering in others and functions not being able to bear other suffering, non-cruelty, and uh, seeing helplessness in others, overwhelmed by suffering. It succeeds when the cruelty, like wishing harm, or like wanting to observe People suffer, subsides. But when it, f- it fails, when this compassion somehow becomes sorrow, what happens? It, be- it becomes unwholesome. There's attachment already. That this person is suffering and you want to cry together with the person. You become, it becomes an unwholesome mind and you're no longer effective. Okay? Sympathetic joy, gladness at other success, functions being unenvious, and the elimination of aversion, seeing the success of others, proximate cause. 
So when you see other people success uh, in terms of uh, being successful or that uh, doing good deeds, because based on your wisdom, you know good deeds are wholesome and that you're understanding a lot of karma. This will give rise to wholesome result in the future. And then, uh, so you'll be very happy when you see people doing good or people gaining something and so on. But it feels when you're so jubilant, you know, it becomes um, uh, so overjoyed. It's then it will not be sympathetic joy. There will be attachment coming in again and it becomes unwholesome minds again. I- ignorance comes in, restlessness comes in. Wisdom. Characteristic of penetrating things according to the intrinsic nature. Function is to illuminate the objective field like a lamp. Manif- the manifestation is this non-bewilderment. And proximate cause is wise attention. I like to explain in terms of insight. Like um, like in our daily life, we perhaps um, maybe as a doctor, you know, you, you see a certain conditions, you examine the patient, you cut the history, you take some investigation. In the moment, you know what's the diagnosis and what's the cause of it. It's a moment of insight. And there's wisdom there. Okay, but uh, wisdom again, the various grades, that is just wisdom about conventional wisdom. But if you develop, develop with this quality of penetrative understanding there, all the wisdom will culminate into the Four Noble Truths. Seeing things penetratively, the the intuition, okay. wisdom feels like intuition. It's just that at this point in time, the intuition is very accurate. You just know that this is a good person. This is uh, not uh, someone to to totally trust. That is the right teaching. This one is a bit wrong. You know, there's this intuition there. And but if the wisdom is not there, the concentration is not there, the intuition is may not be accurate. Okay, so that's the insight. So how does the mind become beautiful or unwholesome? So just now we talk about the quality of wholesome mind. Beautiful. Why is it called beautiful in 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 Pali language? Wholesome. They don't the, all the wholesome mind. They don't call it wholesome because the Buddha, the Arahants also have those qualities, but it's no longer effective in creating karma. So it's not, not about wholesome or unwholesome. It's no longer wholesome or unwholesome. So the better word to use for all this faith, uh, mindfulness, equanimity, are beautiful mental factors. So it's beautiful mind and unwholesome mind. How does the mind become beautiful and unwholesome? Like uh, when you see a flower, when does it become unwholesome? When does it become wholesome? When you see, uh, um, say, your loved one, when does it become attachment and when does it become loving kindness? You know? And when you have uh, certain, uh, you gain certain position, when does it become uh, uh, just, um, say, joy, um, wholesome minds? And when does it become unwholesome mind? So let's see. You have to understand the cognitive process. I have to go, go through this very fast. I think I'm, I'm more than an hour already. <laughs> Sorry about this. So when we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, perceive, or think about an object, okay, immediately, um, like for example, the image of the car, okay, it strikes your eye, then you have, not immediately, you, you will, uh, you'll, you'll be aware of it, you know. There will be three moments of this subconscious days. Uh, we call it bhavanga mind. Okay, three moments of it. And then there is this mind or averting with the seven universal mental factors there. Consciousness is always there. And applied thought, sustained thought, and decision. And immediately, there is this I consciousness, which is only eight mental factors. The seven universal plus the consciousness. And there's the, the receiving. The mind after the consciousness, then is receiving mind. And then uh, investigation, investigating mind. That's a pleasant object. So the joy will happen in this investigating mind. In meditation, you will feel like, oh, um, uh, tom yam soot, water, tom yam soot, herbal soot, you know, like that. <laughs> okay. Then the um, determining mind, the decision happens. Okay. You make a determination of this object and you will have, perhaps it's a wholesome mind that occurs to you when you saw that object. Huh? Then all these 34 mental factors appear and it continue on for seven times. That is where the karma generates. 
For example, you look at a car like that and you see it as impermanent suffering non-self and you're very happy about this insight. There is this 34 mental factors and seven times pop, 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 and this is all wholesome karma. Then there'll be a two moments of registration and then it goes into sleep okay, for a few thought processes. And after that, uh, the mind, you know, after the eye consciousness, the mind continues to savor on the object. All this happens within split second. Millions of this happen. Okay? So the mind thought, thought process, immediately is a mind averting mind, which is decision and energy. And then it's just all these seven javanas again, okay? where you savor the object and create karma, and then the registration, go back to sleep again. Yeah? The sleep is not so... Not like sleeping, it's just a subconscious day. It's like sometimes when we are so sleepy in the daytime, we like, ah, then you're in Bhavanga. Sometimes in meditation, you're so relaxed, relaxed. You're in a daze. That's Bhavanga again. It's not Jhana. Okay. Okay, then uh, this is the, the thing that I want to emphasize. It's the moment of determining uh, before the Javanas happen. At this point in time, the the mental factor of attention, which is a one, two, three, four, the number six one, attention, is where wholesome mind and unwholesome mind is decided. Okay. Um, in this determining mind is the attention. If you avert the attention on the object as permanent, pleasurable, self, or beautiful, then immediately unwholesome mind will come. Either attachment or aversion or delusion. For example, you see the image of car, you call it, oh, BMW convertible, wow, that's beautiful. You know? The averting on the object, uh, the, the, the qualities, the, the values that are added is mind. You know? But immediately when the eye see it, you look at it and it occurs to you as beautiful, immediately there will be attachment mind and it's unwholesome mind. And the thought of it coming in, uh, oh, it's beautiful, it's a BMW convertible. And that is the, um, the mind object seeing it as that. Uh, then it's all, it's the attending to the beautiful side of the object or the pleasurable side. Self, what is self? Self is the thing being substantial or the thing being yours. Another example, like for example, you're meditating and you have... Uh, and you're always having wandering thoughts. And then you are angry at yourself for having wandering thoughts. Why am I having wandering thoughts? Please, no, no, that is anger. Why? What happened? You have owned the angry thoughts. Or you have owned the wandering mind, as if it is yours. Okay? Or the sleepiness happened. Oh, why am I sleepy? I'm a sleepy person. Or when you become proud, huh? why am I so proud? You have owned the conceit. You have regarded conceit as a self. We are not just talking about visual object or sound object, even mind object of even like conceit, for example. You identify this heart as a proud heart, a conceited heart, and then you see yourself as a conceited person. You have assumed ownership of conceit, and immediately what follows is unwholesome mind, and the conceit will be stuck on to you. Okay, or jealousy. Oh, I'm a jealous person. You have personalized or assume the identity and you have made a, put a self to that quality. In fact, if you look at the mind, it just arises and passes away. There's jealousy, but there's nobody who's jealous. There's, there's knowing, but there's no knower. There is, there is uh, joy, but there's no person being joyful. It just arises and passes away. You know? Pleasurable, permanent. Yeah. Or if you see immediately as a flower, it's beautiful. Like you see a flower being beautiful, immediately that mind is unwholesome mind because you, identi you see the beauty, there's attachment. But most of the time, we are not very attached to flowers. You see it's beautiful immediately, perhaps huh, you switch your mind. Oh, I can offer to the Buddha. You offer. The object is not the flower already. The object is the thought of offering. It's a mental object and the mind is wholesome. Okay? Proper attention is when you attend to object as non-permanent, non-pleasurable, non-self, non-beautiful. Without giving all this value of permanence, ple pleasurable, it's like, you see that it's just a color image of a car, you know. And car is just a concept of a vehicle, you know. It's just a concept. Like the breath. Breath is just a concept of a breath. You don't cling on to it as permanent, pleasurable, self, or beautiful, or, or ugly, you know. You just breath as a breath. And this concept will lead you on to concentration. Rejoicing in the offering of flowers. The object is the, the 
either the vision of somebody offering flowers or the thought of somebody offering, practicing dana, and you rejoice at that. And that is, you didn't think of it as permanent, pleasurable self, and so on. So how do we quick assess? When this was the, the opening statement when Mahamogalana um, was practicing on his own and he's uh, struck with a lot of uh, drowsiness and the Buddha told him the various ways to overcome drowsiness. So after he overcome drowsiness, Mahamogalana, all things are not fit to be clung on to. So when you think all things are not fit to be ground to, it's neither self, permanent, pleasurable, beautiful. It's just all things. Whether is it visual, sound, even mental, even Dhamma, you know, even Buddha, all things are not fit to be clung on to. Immediately, it's a proper attention to things. You can help people, but there's no clinging. You, know? you can do good deeds, but there's no clinging. You can enjoy your food, it's not clinging. It just taste, taste, it's pleasant taste, arise and pass away. It nourishes the body, you know. You just do this, and it's just a concept of nourishment of the body. And this body is just a vehicle to practice, you know. So you just, all things are not fit to be clung on to. Then quickly, another quick access is let go. Let go. Quick access to right attention. Easy to say. <laughs> so why do we talk, want to talk about beautiful mind? Because beautiful mental factors or wholesome mind is our real refuge. When we have not attained to enlightenment, we take refuge in wholesome minds. Like when you're struck with disaster, you know, like uh, something, a bad diagnosis on your body or on your loved ones. It's so sad, isn't it? But you have beautiful mind at the moment. You're protected from that sadness or the suffering. Or that uh, because you have beautiful mind, beautiful mind, you keep the precepts because there's conscience there. And perhaps one day somebody is catching somebody who steals, and then you are, uh, all your friends are drinking, but you never drink because you don't want to break the precept. You're protected from the, the problems of drinking or gambling. You know? So this is our real refuge. Mindfulness is our real refuge. Wisdom is our real refuge. Faith is our refuge. Conscience is our refuge. Lightness is our refuge. Softness is our refuge. Wilderness is our refuge. Beautiful mind is equal to good karma. Especially when you're doing the javanas. I mean, you, not doing the javanas, but the moment of javanas, you're creating wholesome karma. So when we, so it's all good karma. You know, as we like uh, pay respect to the Buddha, as beautiful mind, it's good karma. Okay? When we die with a beautiful mind, for example, we pay respect to the Buddha and suddenly there's an explosion and all of us die. We'll all go to a good existence will support us. What have we wished for? Perhaps all our life, the biggest wish is maybe to be, uh, to be with our loved one again and again and again, life after life after life. This wholesome karma will support you to do that okay, in the human realm. Or perhaps the wish, all your wish is just to, to, to really help people or maybe as a heavenly being helping people. Then suddenly explosion happens and we're paying rest for the Buddha. The wish will come true for you. A habit of keeping our minds beautiful will support us the next time we get a chance to go for meditation. I, this is another thing I wanted to say. Is um, um, I, I believe, uh, I mean, of course it would be good and wonderful if we can all go for a long retreats. Maybe we can just let go of all our burdens and become monks or nuns. You know, it's wonderful, but... As I see, it is not necessary for all of us. Um, some people can stay in a meditation center for years and years and years, but uh, um, they may not have beautiful minds, or they may not have the um, the humility or the uh, other things. You know, maybe because of past practice, didn't practice in the past. Now it's starting afresh. Uh, I mean, no value judgment. Just that. Uh, but if you keep yourself mind always maintaining wholesome in daily life because promises to keep and mouths to go before I sleep. Huh? So you have to work. You have to take care of people. You want to be self-reliant so that you don't be a burden. You continue to work. Not out of attachment, but out of compassion. You know? So you work and work. So we keep ourselves 
our mind wholesome, then one day when the conditions are there, we go on a retreat, one month, two months, we progress fast. But some people, perhaps, they, they, they want to oh, go on a long retreat and then they think that uh, they, they hate life or they don't like the society. Everybody's so full of unwholesome mind. Only I have a wholesome mind. So they go. They have a version on their mind. <laughs> okay. Then they go, you, you won't progress. It's not about whether you are a monk or a lay person or in a retreat or in daily life. It's really about wholesome mind. The retreat setting is important because in the cultivation of concentration, you need seclusion. You can't practice mindfulness in daily life and expect to gain enlightenment. No. That is just preparing, you know, like keeping precepts. It's very important. But keeping precepts alone, you won't go into, you won't see nibbana. Okay? So you keep precepts, you practice wholesome mind. When the conditions come, you go into seclusion, you attain to concentration easily. Whether in a lay person or as a monk, really, it's not that important. Then you, um, and then with clear concentration, the mind is clear, it is sharp, and then you apply the mind on materiality, and then on mentality, internally, externally, then you do past, present, future, and see the cause and effect, and you, and you apply the concentration on the past, present, and future, materiality and mentality in terms of its impermanent suffering non-self. And that's how you over you, you see the Four Noble Truth. You know? The whole Buddhist path is about cultivating and maintaining a beautiful mind. Unwholesome mind will frustrate our practice. If you have an ego or you have an achieving attitude as you practice, you will be, you will be frustrated. Um, if it's conceited mind or a jealous mind or a craving mind as if like a you want to you crave for jhanic um, states. That's craving minds. You know, then you crave for it. Then you'll be frustrated. Your practice will be frustrated. So examples of beautiful minds. These are convenient examples because according to the scriptures, these are the ten good deeds. Huh? Generosity is wholesome mind. Service, other helping people is wholesome mind. Keeping the precepts is wholesome mind. Meditation, both concentration and insight are wholesome mind. Reverence is wholesome. Sharing Reverence meaning paying respect you know, to the Buddha, the Dhamma and Sangha. Um, sharing merits. Sharing merits is very wholesome. You're sharing merits and for all you know there may be ghosts around here and when they observe that, they'll have this gratitude and their sympathetic joy. That's necessarily in their heart that's wholesome mind. That is their refuge, you know. Rejoicing in merits. When other people share merits or do good deeds and we are very happy with that, we have wholesome mind. There's sympathetic joy. Sharing of Dhamma, listening to Dhamma and straightening out our views. The practice is a series of wholesome mind. I mean, what's the practice? It's about keep having the faith in the practice, keeping our virtues and practice morality, uh, generosity. And we listen to the Dhamma or to a teacher, then we think about it. It could be reading, not listening, because these are from the um, Anguttara Nikaya. Listening is at the base. At that time, there is no written language. So, I mean, written, the, the Dhamma is not written down, so it's just listening. But listening also includes reading. Listening, reading, thinking about it, and then putting it into practice. These are all wholesome minds. And in the practice, is the practice of precepts. In keeping the precepts, your morality becomes purified. Right speech, right action, right livelihood which is the three of the Eightfold Path. And then with the morality as a basis, you can concentrate easily. You practice Samatha meditation, um, of one of the 40 objects of meditation. And based on this, you have concentration, um, which is uh, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. In the Sutta, the concentration is defined as first to the fourth jhana. In the commentaries, it also includes excess concentration in the, s- in the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth jhanas. And with concentration, you see things as they really are. You apply it on ultimate reality, not just, oh, human life arise and pass away. I mean, as they age, they grow old and they die. This is vipassana, no. And my hand move up and move down. This is not vipassana. Vipassana, you have to use concentration and see into its ultimate reality of earth, water, fire, and wind, color, smell, taste, and nutritive essence. And perhaps um, if it's a um, kamacha rupa, you can see the 
other um, Rupa cactus, which are ultimate reality, and you see them arise and pass away. And you see the characters are impermanent. And then because of that, is there's no peace, there's a suppression, and you know that that is Dukkha, without words. Uh, you can see that. And then Anicca, Dukkha, and then you see that nothing you own. This not you, this not you, this you, this not you. There's nothing you own, there's nothing here, nothing there. It's just a flame. It's burning because of a fuel. And the mind is just a dream. Bop, 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 just a vibration, like vibes. Bop, 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 bop. So it's just, all beings are like this. This is like this, this is like that. So, Vipassana on materiality and mentality. And it's not just this. Vipassana, in defined in Sangrita Nikaya, is, you look at the five aggregates in terms of impermanent suffering non-self, and on top of that, it must be past, present, and future. You have to see the past. If you don't see the past, you don't see cause and effect. You only see the first truth. To realize the second truth, you need to see the past. Past lives and future lives. And what caused this and what caused that. What, how the cause and the conditions support the effects for other things. So you do vipassana on past, present, and future in its ultimate reality. So that even all the memories and all the hopes have no self. And then you arrive at wisdom, which is right view and right thought. And in the seven verifications, it's like that. And so the whole practice is just a series of beautiful minds. Learning points. Unpleasant feelings are always associated with aversion. Happy feelings can arise in both wholesome and unwholesome feelings. So what feels right may not always be right. Unwholesome minds arise when we attend object as permanent, pleasurable, essential, or beautiful. Wholesome minds occur when we don't. So that's all. <laughs> Sorry, it's a few slides, but actually there are many... <laughs> animation. <laughs> Any questions or comments?